I play piccolo in the Charlotte Symphony, um, also sound flute as well, obviously. So, and my background is, I've been here, I think this is my 11th season, yeah, something like that. And um, I did my, all my degrees are in performance, undergrad at Northwestern, and master's and doctorate at University of Cincinnati. And I'm finishing my doctorate, I swear I'm finishing it this year. <laughs> all I have to do is write my Be the one finished. So, um, do you have your topic? Oh yeah, topic's approved, I've started my research, like, it's all good, except I have a three-year-old, so I have no time to do anything other than potty train and play <laughs> tricks. <laughs> what so, is the topic? The topic is, um, actually my teacher at Northwestern, uh, Wally Kujala, so it's, you know, one of those fancy things with a colon in it. It's the pedagogy of Walford Kujala, so you know that you, it's really smart. Um, the American Flute School and its ties to the French Flute School of the late 19th century. Yeah. It makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I pretty much know. <laughs> so, yeah. so, oh, let me get you hand out. Um, I'm literally bowing down to you because I can't come up with a creative thing ever in my life. I can't do anything. I can maybe cook, but that's about it for creativity. So I'm in awe of anybody who can put anything on paper. It's just amazing. So um, one of the things that I think is most important when you are writing for uh, any sort of flute composition, uh, you have a commission, you have a friend who wants something, is remember that flute players, um, we have a wide variety of choices. And most flute players like to play other instruments in the flute family besides just the flute, especially piccolo. Um, so the family, of course, is pick is the highest, flute, alto flute, which is not too much lower than normal flute, but has such a unique and different color and timbre that it's really good to write for. And then you have bass flute, contrabass, and subcontrabass, which the real flute geeks really get into. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these have their own kind of timbre and sound and kind of sonic possibilities. So it's worth exploring to um, kind of get to know all of the instruments in the family. Um, one interesting thing with writing uh, for anything in the flute family is you can experiment with shades and different sounds by having your performer switch instruments. So for example, um, John Allmeyer, who's working with this festival, I just performed two of his pieces a few weeks ago um, here in Charlotte that uh, he had a whole concert, choreography murder and everything. Ballads. Yeah, murder ballads, yeah. And when we were rehearsing, uh, we're rehearsing the pieces, uh, there was one line where he wanted the strings to be soft, but to be the prominent voice. And he had me kind of up high on a, um, on a kind of sustained note. And he kept saying, can you make that softer? Can you, can you just get it, can you just kind of bring it down a little bit? You're, you're a little, you know, too prominent, you're covering the string line. And I said, well, you know, I'm kind of playing as soft as I can. There's a limit to, you know, you can't stop blowing because you didn't get any sound. But this was right up at the top of the um, staff, just above the staff. So I think I was on like B flats and A's, which for flute players, the notes just at the top of the staff between about A and C sharp are the hardest on the instrument. Because the embouchure has to be right or they crack. So when you're playing soft, it's it's treacherous territory. Actually, the higher notes above that get a lot easier. So I said to John, well, what do you think if I play down an octave on piccolo? Let's see what it sounds like. And, sorry, it's a little flat. And he said, wow, it's great. It's exactly the sound that I want. So just by bringing out another instrument in the family, we solved a problem. We got the exact sound that he was looking for, and I could play without killing my lips and face, and be quiet enough so that the strings could really float, and it sounded great. So keep in mind kind of your timbral possibilities between the different instruments in the family. Um, most players, of course, 
have a flute and a piccolo. A lot of players also have an alto flute. I own my own alto. Um, and uh, beyond that, you kind of have to look for universities or flute choirs, you know, specialists. And I've included on here some of the um, kind of big shots in the flute community. Um, piccolo, there is a piccolo symposium that's happening uh, now every summer that Christy Beard does out in Nebraska. And this year, for the first time, they have a call for scores. Now this just ended, so unfortunately it's, it's too late. But next year, they have a call for scores. Flute players tend to be nuts about getting new stuff, especially piccolo players. We love new pieces because really, aside from Vivaldi Concerti, which aren't really even for piccolo, um, there was nothing written for our instrument until eh, roughly the last 25-ish years. And then I don't know what caused this impetus of you know, compositions you know, being done, but there's just been an explosion of piccolo music, and piccolo <coughs> players love it. We love performing this stuff, and um, you will find that there's a very voracious community. Um, so there are some possibilities with piccolo. Low flutes as well. There's this one lady named um, Chris Potter who is like the low flute lady, and she loves to get new compositions for alto, bass, and beyond. Past that, flute choir, um, universities typically, if there's a performance program, have a flute choir requirement. I had to do flute choir all through undergrad. Um, and even organizations like National Flute Association, some of the regional flute clubs, um, flute choir is really, really popular. And the flute choir people that like it really, really like it. So that's another possibility. Give you some um, chance to maybe, you know, have some exploration into the entire community of, of flutes. So keep in mind your choices for writing for the instrument. Um, with I put what is allowed, <laughs> we'll pretty much play what you write to the best of our ability. And there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, some of the extended techniques, as they're known, are easier for performers than others. And for people that are kind of more classically geared, some of the harder techniques, you know, they have a little bit of a problem with. Like, I, I still can't figure out how to circular breathe. I've been trying, and I'll probably have to have a private lesson on it. But standard um, extended techniques that every flute player should know how to do, oh, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> are flutter tonguing, of course, you know, so make a kind of annoying rapid fire. Um, playing harmonics, so, you know, for different sonic possibility. So, just some, you know, again, different colors, different sounds. Um, whistle tones, uh, which you have to be careful with because they are very, very soft. So, you know, use them sparingly, but they can be effective for some high notes. So it's, you know, if it's more than kind of an intimate chamber setting, they're, they're not very good to use. Um, key slapping, really easy. And flutes are very durable. We can slap our keys very hard and it's not going to damage the instrument. Um, pitch bending, of course, you know, the lowest octave, it's the easiest for flutes to do pitch bends. Okay, yeah, get a little sour. Um, jet whistling, which has been around for a while like that. Um, so most of your kind of garden variety flute players will be able to do all of these techniques and probably some more that I forgot to put on the list. Um, the more advanced ones that take a little bit more work, a little bit more practicing, and maybe um, dedication on the part of the flutist include multiphonics, um, singing while playing, which once you get it, it's actually really easy. Microtonality, microtones, you know, kind of purposely not in a bend, trying to have a out of tune note. And then pieces requiring circular breathing. Like I said, not a lot of flute players are kind of competent with circular breathing. I can do the, but I can't make, you know, make it work on the flute. So there are a few um, teachers. What does that mean? 
Oh, okay. Circular breathing. Sir, okay, circular breathing. Um, on a wind instrument, you store air in your cheeks and then use your cheek muscles to blow that air out as you're breathing in through your nose. So you get a continuous sound. So, you know, you know Kenny G, right? The cheesy sax guy. Um, he's very short in real life. We did a concert with him and he came out on stage and it was like, oh, wow. Uh, and skinny. It's like he's all hair. Um, <laughs> but you know, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for playing the longest note, and it's this gimmick where he's circular breathing. So, um, and it's easier on woodwind instruments that you have something in your mouth, because then you have instantly something to, you know, have your lips against to store up the air, and on flute, it's, I, I <laughs> I can't get it. I bought the book and I can't get it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, can't do it. Um, but there are a handful of flute players around the country who know how to do this. I, I'm going to learn, I promise you. Um, like Rob Cronin in Atlanta, Robert Dick, um, Mary Kay Fink up in Cleveland. So there, there are people who, who learn how to do it. It really does have a valuable place in flute playing, um, or any woodwind playing. So multiphonics playing more than one note at, at a time. Um, some are easier on the flute than others, so some of the easier ones are like... There it is. Like that. They get a little squirrely, um, and open holes tend to be something that you need to have in order to make a lot of these work because some of them you are pushing down just the rim instead of actually covering the key. So make sure that if you're writing a specific piece for a specific um, performer that they're going to have the equipment that's, that's necessary to, to play. Um, some of the biggest things that I've come across in flute music of any era that tend to be problematic are breaths, like we have to breathe, <laughs> and flute takes more air than any other woodwind instrument, um, takes more air than most brass instruments up until you get to about trombone and tuba. So flute players really need rests inserted into the music so that we can, you know, get a good breath. Um, with that, uh, me personally, I have to swallow every now and then I spit, I get, like, breathe and then I choke, which is always kind of um, disgusting and embarrassing. So um, every now and then, if you can put a little rest in so that we can take care of wiping our chins because, you know, kind of get greasy, especially down here in the heat and humidity in the summer, and our flutes are doing this down our face, which is <laughs> makes it difficult to play. So I, if you see flute players constantly doing this, that's why we need to keep this um, not Crisco'd up. Um, <laughs> Having enough time to change between instruments, I, after I made this big spiel about, hey, please compose for the variety of instruments, well, make sure that you give us enough time to put a flute on our peg and pick something else up. Um, that's really bad in orchestral playing, and I find a lot of times that I have to leave stuff out so that I have time to change instruments. Um, and then keep performance-related <laughs> injury at a minimum. With some of these things, um, especially the multiphonics, they require such awkward and strange fingerings that in my experience, and I know this has happened to other colleagues of mine, we're working up a piece and we start getting tendonitis or you know problems with our wrists because we're literally contorting ourselves in a way that's very uncomfortable and awkward. So um, be careful as you compose that you're not uh, requiring your performer to constantly be doing things that end up um, kind of straining us more than we're already strained with this very awkward way that we hold the instrument to begin with. Questions on any of this step so far? Okay, cool. Um, if you are unaware of some of the most prominent flute composers today, and this is just a short list that I put together, um, 
because certainly there are a lot more than just these folks, but if you talk to any flute player, these are going to be kind of people at the top of their list. We love music by these people. Um, Robert Dick, if you are unfamiliar with his music, he is kind of the father of all of this. Not that there weren't some extended techniques before he came along, because of course there were. We've been flutter tonguing, even double tonguing used to be considered an extended technique. Um, so we've been doing that, obviously, for quite a while. But he came along, uh, he was born, I believe, in 1950. He's a flutist, uh, classically trained at Juilliard, and he, after learning to play one note at a time, it never occurred to him that he would not play more than one note at a time, and he said to his teacher, okay, now how do I play two notes at a time? And the teacher was like, what are you talking about? We don't play two notes at a time. Um, and really up until he started exploring this area, Flutus knew of a few funny fingerings that made some multiphonics and oh ha ha isn't this cute and funny. And he literally spent years as a composition student figuring out every possibility for contorted fingerings that make various multiphonic uh, sounds. So um, he is a fantastic flute player, performer. Uh, he invented, if you want to have a giggle, <laughs> He invented a sliding head joint, which you can buy if you feel like blowing, you know, however many thousand dollars. So, and he showed it to me when it was a prototype. He was really excited about it. Where the lip plate slides, so this has been extended, and there's a thing that connects to your face like a headgear, <laughs> junior high, and you play and you <laughs> like this. So he's got a video on YouTube called Sliding Life Blues a piece that he wrote and if you just you know go to YouTube and type in his name you'll find this sliding life blues it is the most crazy piece ever but it's really awesome and he is um, he really is kind of the master of all of the contemporary techniques that uh, composers are requiring of us today um, the new guy on the scene is Ian Clark he is from England and he's kind of popped on to the flute scene and, you know, just wowed everybody over the last, oh, I don't know, five plus years. Um, he has several compositions, and he's a flutist, so, you know, he's, he's writing some good stuff for flute. Um, several compositions that are, again, using some of the most cutting edge um, extended techniques. Let me stick that for a second. One second to Robert Dick. Sorry, I was going to show you this. So I brought a piece of his that is actually uh, was written for high schoolers for a high school competition. So again, these things are, you know, for advanced high school students, they should be able to play these things. One thing that is very popular with his music is he includes on the page everything that you need to know to play the music. So the opening, you have your first D, start singing, overblow all the harmonics. You have a... Uh, double stop, which is just with the same uh, one fingering. You have your first multiphonic, which he includes the fingering. And then you keep seeing the same one over and over. You have singing and playing, a pitch glint, bend or glissando, um, more double stops, double stops. And it kind of goes on and on like this. He stops writing at the second page. You don't keep getting the fingering because you have it, but for each time that you come back to these fingerings, he puts the little flute chart on the bottom, which me, is really very helpful um, as the performer, because sometimes it's hard to, you know, you're worried about notes and everything else going on at the same time. It's hard to remember the multiphonic fingering. And if anybody wants to take a look at these, you certainly can come up. Um, Ian Clark, kind of the same thing where this is one of his easier pieces. I've never worked it up to play it, but I've looked at it. Um, the whole first page, he writes the whole first page in one breath, um, which isn't fun. <laughs> so you're getting instructions as you go, fingerings, everybody can see, as you go, right on the page. So we like that. So if you're going to use multiphonics, I would recommend putting the little chart right on the page rather than like an instruction sheet at the beginning of the piece. Um, 
Mike Mower is a jazz musician, I think um, saxophone mainly, but uh, writing some really great jazz inspired flute music right now. Um, Gary Shocker is a flutist, Juilliard trained, living in New York. Um, his music's it's not my favorite because it's a little cheesy, but flute players love him, so I kind of you know, have to obliged to bring him up. Um, and then, you know, Daniel Dorf, um, Rob Cronin in Atlanta. I'm sure you all have heard of Jennifer Higdon, Lil Lieberman. Um, the lady at the bottom, Phyllis Lauk, she said, <laughs> if you want to write some flute choir music, get in good with her because she is the flute choir queen and uh, she will help you, you know, get some music out there for potential uh, choirs and audiences. And then I thought I'd talk about some of the kind of trending things in flute playing right now. So um, have any of you heard of Greg Patillo? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so he's the beatboxing flutist. Everybody's nuts for beatboxing right now. It's like the big thing. Um, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> like I, I watch it and it's like, okay, you can figure it out. But he travels the country performing and also giving beatboxing classes to flute clubs and, you know, symposiums and stuff. So... If you want to really impress the younger crowd now, put some beatboxing in your music. Um, <laughs> and it also makes good for like when we go out to uh, schools, like a part of my job at the symphony is to go out to the grade schools and show the kiddies, this is the flute and look what I can do. And they love it when you can do stuff like this. Like one time, this is several years ago, I went to some school and I was like, this is the flute, who knows this? Wait, how does it go? music, of course, um, really, really big right now in, in flute writing. As, as with everything, you go to the gym and you do Zumba, you go out to the club and you're doing salsa. So flute players right now are really liking the Latin-inspired music. Um, maybe a little bit more on the fringe, but still relevant, um, Japanese traditional music in the style of Takamitsu or Fukushima, who both wrote great pieces for solo flute. Um, and even more than just Japanese Asian music in general. It's a very prolific piccolo composer named David Loeb, who writes all sorts of pieces in different Asian styles for solo piccolo that we piccolo players just love. They're kind of go-to pieces for recitals. Um, if you have a brave enough flute player, which I'm not, <laughs> flute and electronics, a good friend of mine, Lindsay Goodman, who lives up in West Virginia, is really big with flute and electronics and she's got all the setups. She's got the mics and the foot pedals and the, you know, I don't even know what all, but she is really big. She also goes up and does uh, Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble. Um, full microtonal music, again, you've got to find kind of the one, you know, really dedicated flute player, but if you're unaware of this, Brandon Brothers, who are one of the biggest flute makers in the United States, they make a flute that is fully microtonal. And uh, Robert Dick, again, helped with the development of this, as well as Ava Kingma, who is a uh, flute maker from oh, Denmark. I can't remember where she's from. Um, so, and you can, I included the website, you can go online and look. Each key on the flute that is not vented with a hole has a key within a key. So say you have your A key here. There will be a cutout in the middle with a key resting on the key and a button somewhere on the flute that you can have the A key depressed but push the button and the middle of the key opens and vents. So you get a full quarter tone scaled flute. Um, it is the craziest thing I've ever laid eyes on. You can play it as a normal flute so if you um, you know, again, want to blow $20,000 and have it, you can play it as a normal flute, but then, you know, have all the microtonal possibilities with it. I don't know how many people own one of these flutes, but they must be selling well enough that Brandon keeps making them. So they are out there if you uh, want to seek somebody out. And then I already mentioned piccolo and low flutes. They're really nuts. We really like new music. Um, so 
uh, International Piccolo Symposium. Nicole Esposito does the Iowa Piccolo Intensive, which is kind of weird that the two in America are right next to each other, Nebraska and Iowa. And then the National Flute Association has an entire low flutes committee. So again, these performers, they want music, they want new things to play because there's not that much stuff written, especially for bass flute. Um, the others, the contrabass and sub-bass, pretty much only for flute choir. But um, alto, we've got a little bit of stuff. Bass, not a whole lot of stuff. And these people want music to play. So um, when you're writing, if you're not a flute player by insane choice, um, there are some books that will help you out with your compositions. The most relevant, you knew it was going to happen, Robert Dick. <laughs> he, this is the Bible. Um, I would imagine that every university that, that you guys attend are going to have, it's going to be in your library. Um, here he is. He looks a little scarier now because this picture's, I think, from the 80s. <laughs> so now, if you look at him online, his eyebrows are at least like six inches long and they stick out and he, like, he, he kind of looks like a mad scientist. You know? But um, this is everything that you will need to know for how to write special effects for flu. And it's broken down by chapter um, with diagrams, you know, what, uh, what holes are you dealing with, um, how to put your little flutey diagram together, and he goes on and gives you every known fingering for every note that's playable on the flute. And remember, the flute range, in case you... Um, we're unaware, of course, most American flutes, we play the low B directly beneath middle C on the piano. Um, Europeans tend to favor flutes with a C foot, but most Americans are down here with a B. The flute traditionally goes up to C, I'm going to start this with one, one, two, three, four, um, which is the next to the top octave on piano. But Flutes go well beyond that, and most flute players are going to be comfortable playing C sharp. Sorry, these are gross. D, E flat, E. E is the highest note that I've ever personally played a composition requiring. Um, flutes do go beyond that F. F sharp and G. I, I, even I'm not that big of a flute geek. I don't remember the fingerings. If I need to look them up, they're online. But, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank God for the internet. <laughs> but um, one of them, F and F sharp, one of them only works on a C foot and one of them only works on a B foot. So you kind of have to be careful. If you do want to write the crazy notes, you know, just keep in mind that one of them will not work on each type of flute. So this goes on to include your high notes. Um, then he's got, if you want to do microtones and you don't have one of the Brandon King System flutes, you've got how to play all your microtone notes on a normal flute. Again, assuming open hole, because where you see a half-covered key, you need to put down just the rim. Um, how to do, let's see, slides and glissandos, um, which, you know, it tells you exactly which keys to, and a lot of this is intuitive. Most flute players can figure it out without um, referring to this book. Every multiphonic that's possible on flute, and every now and then with compositions, I run into things that they don't really work, or the composer has indicated a fingering and the pitches that they want, and then I play the fingering, and guess what? I don't get the pitches that they want. So just kind of double check if you write these things for your flute player. Just you know, double check that they really do work in real life. Um, so it kind of goes on and on with literally everything that you can do with the flute. So if you are writing and you're using special effects, this is your book to use. Um, the older 
kind of go to that, again, is still relevant and most libraries are going to have is the James Pellwright book. He was the professor of flute at Indiana University for years and years, and a very successful studio. And um, he was the first person to put anything like this together. So again, all of your possibilities, like he has you know, tremolos, if you want to go between two different notes, you know, this is all the ones that are possible. Um, all your trill fingerings, harmonics, um, and multiphonics in the back. So maybe not quite as extensive as the Robert Dick book, but again, still relevant. Um, in poking around, there are plenty of online sites. Say you don't, you know, your library's closed and you're like, oh, what's the fingering? I need a, you know, a G and a whatever at the same time. There are online websites, you're not. And um, <laughs> one that I personally like is Matt Muller, who is, I don't even know from where, but he includes um, a whole web page of here's how to do this, here's how to do this, here's how to do this. It's directed towards performers, but again, could be a invaluable tool for composers. Um, and then two books that are kind of, again, a little bit maybe more outdated, the Stokes and Condon Special Effects for Flute and the Bartolazzi New Sounds for Woodwind, which was the first of its kind um, for pretty much all of this. The Bartolazzi book is the one that Takamitsu used in writing his flute pieces. Again, the fingerings, he wants specific notes. They don't really work. So when I perform Takamitsu, I always make sure to pull out my uh, Robert Dick book, make sure, okay, I need to get the notes that he wants me to play. So, but, you know, if you are into, you know, the history of special effects for the flute, those are some books that are, you know, worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Like I said, what is allowed, I, I put kind of some of the things that I've come across, there are certainly more things. Yes? How would you notate a uh, flutter? Because, I mean, to me, it, for, that for, for uh, a moment I was like, wait a minute, what is... What's a growl on a flute? Because growling on a saxophone is similar to just that sound, and I realize it's the flutter time. Ah, okay. How do you notate flutter time? I've seen it several different ways. You can, let's see. Hey, look, there's a marker. Must be the one from upstairs. <laughs> you can, like, put your note here and do something like that. Um, I've seen things like this. Flutter tongue, or there's sometimes a Z in there if the composer is German. Um, I'm trying to think what else I've seen. Elizabeth, you think of anything else? I forget what it's used for, but what is the one where you have the note and then like a Z or something above it? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Like you'll have something like this. Some <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> That's usually the point in the piece when you wish you could get <laughs> So yeah, there's, there's kind of different standard notations, um, and as long as you are clear with, you know, FL something around the note, or in a preface to your piece, you write, hey, if I've got three lines on the note, you know, to flutter tongue, we'll be, we'll be pretty clear with it. And like in my part, I'll, I'll just make sure I'll take my pencil and, you know, write flutter above the note. You can write flutter, um, kind of whatever you want. Flutists can do flutter tongue in two different ways, um, and some flutists find that one or the other works better for them, or one or the other works better in a specific octave or range. So uh, mostly we're doing a tongue roll, of so you know, gives you a very um, percussive, intense flutter. You can also do a glutteral, like if you speak German. And that gives you a little bit softer flutter tongue sound. Um, and it's particularly nice in the low octave, where sometimes, and I find personally that using a tongue in the low octave, I get too much air and not enough pitch. And then I have to start you know, extending my jaw, which gets uncomfortable. I'll get you in just a sec. So. Little bit less intense but another possibility. Okay. Yes? What's the uh, range of dynamics or the control you have on dynamics with the flutter tongue game? Can you play like really softly or is it mostly like mezzo? <laughs> 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 
Oh, just remind me, I forget, it's been a while since I... It kind of depends on where the note is, um, how easy the note would speak anyways. So like I said, on flute, if we're, of course, with this, the notes between G or A flat and this C sharp are the hardest on the instrument because we're using the lower octave fingering and if the air and the mouth aren't right, we're going to crack down to the lower note. Or if they're really too pinched, then you're going to crack up to the higher note, which is a real pain in the neck. I mean, that's getting you so much hiss in the sound that it's not a great flute sound. Um, fluttering on those notes, tricky. I mean, it's doable. You can flutter on any note on the flute. Um, fluttering soft on those notes. Uh, it's softish. I could definitely play, you know, a lot louder. So there's, you know, a range. Low notes. Um, for me personally, fluttering loud, low gets a little tricky because again you're, you're doing so much crazy manipulation with the jaw and the mouth. Um, super, super high notes, soft, like I'm talking like the extended high notes, D's, E flats, E's, that not, you're never going to play those soft anyways. So fluttering soft. So if you saw, so if you saw a dynamic marking and a score, you would um, take it within context of what's been doable yes. in that range. Yes. Register. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think you have to be afraid. And most performers, like I said, we're always going to try to do the best to play what you have on the page. But at some point, if it's not going to work, we're, we're going to manipulate it to make it work for us. So, yeah, we're going to be okay. <laughs> um, would you be comfortable playing some of these techniques on the piccolo? I'm so glad you asked that. I am, yes. Um, <laughs> can you hear? There are a few pieces that I know of that do incorporate extended techniques on piccolo. One of which I've performed by a Chinese composer named Bun Qing Lam, which was, <laughs> I remember I was in grad school and I was just like, ah! But once I got it, you know, it was fine. I almost brought that music today and I was like, I looked at it and I was like, I haven't played this in like, I don't know, 13 years, I'm not gonna whip this up. So, um, but it does have a smattering of multiphonics, flutter tonguing, pitch bends, things like that. There is one piece written that has a ton of multiphonics and special effects, <laughs> written by Robert Dick. You know, I'm gonna say his name like 8,000 times. Um, it was written for Mary Kay Fink, and it requires a ringed piccolo, like the kind that you would see in Beethoven's time. Um, aside from Mary Kay Fink, I don't know anybody who owns a ringed piccolo, so I think once this piece was premiered, it's been put in the vault, and yeah, good luck. Because <laughs> um, I, I don't even know where to get a ringed piccolo. What makes that different? Like, this is just how the instrument's created? Or? Yes, the older style. Um, what does that do with the sound? I have no idea. Like, literally, ne I've never come across one. I was not at the premiere of the piece. I just know about it. It was at an NFA convention. Um, I, I, I have heard great things about it, but it's, I mean, unless you have that instrument, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, I suppose you can, like, look on eBay and see if you can find older instruments from the end of the 1800s into the early 1900s. Um, I've seen pictures of ringed uh, piccolos. They look basically like teeny tiny clarinets. So, like, some of the keys have just a ring, and some of them are actual keys. And, yeah. Google it and see a picture. They're, they're very pretty, but um, I, I literally know nobody who owns one. Oh, yes, you're so like, do it! Like, like a jet whistle or something? Um, yeah, they work on pick. Maybe not quite as much pitch as on flute. Maybe try changing the finger. Okay, yeah, so you could get a little bit more of the bend if you like that, kind of go up a scale. Um, flutter tonguing on pick, it works. It, it's not maybe quite as elegant as on flute. Sorry. A 
little little jittery, a little too much caffeine. Um, <laughs> Do whistle thumbs work? Yes, whistles can work very well on pick, and you can actually get louder whistle tones on pick than you can on flute. So, all right. Of course, now I can. That's a reasonably annoying one. I think the general thing it might be slightly harder to control than they are in flute. I've not come across a piece with whistle tones for piccolo. Um, but like in, you know, sit in orchestra and be like, and every now and then I'll get like a and it's like, oh, sorry. So, um, might be. They, they do exist. Yeah, exactly. They do exist. Um, multiphonics, not all of them will work on pick. Um, obviously because there are notes, you, you can't have whole because there are no key uh, rings. Um, so some of them will work okay. Singing and playing, of course, will work okay. Um, How about some microtones? Could you maybe like hold down the G sharp key? Yes. And then yes, play? microtones do work fine. So like, um, you can do them either with a lip or. Especially if you got a split E. So there are possibilities for microtones on, on pick. And and then you're masking the out-of-tuneness of the instrument, so <laughs> yay. <laughs> yes, um, and, oh, any, any other specific effect questions for pick? I'm just interested. Okay. In oh, um, by the way, pick, just as an FYI, and piccolo players, we love this because we love to annoy the, the audience and, and the listeners. Um, Flute, you know, goes up to G, B, to this C. Pick, well, standard. Pick can go to the C sharp one octave above that. So technically, the black key next to the high C on piano, that it, and it doesn't exist. Um, so, like, there's a piece where... That's it. Yeah. We are all the way up to the high C sharp. Sorry, you'll have to oh, be my ear a second. Um, there are compositions, <laughs> I shouldn't even say this, that do require a high D. I've not come across these compositions. Um, <laughs> supposedly there's a fingering, which, again, I, I'm just not that big of a pick geek. I'm a pretty big pick geek, but can we just cut it off at C sharp? You know, it's fine. Let's stop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are pieces that go up to high D. I did see, who had this on Facebook? Oh, nuts. A piccolo player friend of mine had on Facebook that somebody wrote a piece with a high E. So that would be two notes above that you know don't exist on the piano. And the person was like, what, what is this? There is, there's no fingering. This is not going to work. I don't know what this person was thinking. So please, that's dog whistle territory. C sharp, yes. D, you got to find a dedicated geek. And above that, please no. Yeah, it's it stops being pitches. So yeah, <laughs> and it's piercing and annoying. Not an orchestral setting, but maybe more like a solo or chamber setting, like in the the more normal ranges, not in the stratus. Yes. What do you find is the most? I mean, obviously, it depends what the composer is specifically thinking of. What do you find is the most effective range for getting the piccolo's sound out there, particularly in like lower voices? Um. I mean, I'm asking that because I, I wrote something that for a pick wrote a part for a piccolo, mm -hmm. specifically because in that range I thought it had a really quirky, interesting voice, yes. but it was sounding lower. And my teacher is like, "Well, you can just put that on the flute while you do it." Like. <coughs> Sort of the timbre and the effect. Yes. So is that something that people often do? Is there a certain range you think works well? For certain? Yes. Low. The lowest range on the pick. We love 
performing in that range. Uh, and this is, if you are interested in kind of um, checking out some good music, look at Mike Moeller's piccolo music. Um, I should have brought it with me. I can't remember it off the top of my head, even though I've performed it a million times. You're down in the lowest notes, and he specifically writes, I'm writing in this range on the piccolo because I love the woody, kind of um, buttery, foie gras timbre of the low notes. So remember, pick lowest is D. We can do a little thing where we cover the end and get like a funky C sharp, but I, I don't like pieces that do that because that's just a pain. So. have quite an edge in that register. You can have more of an ooh in that register. So there's, like, at least for me, I love writing in the low uh, register of the pick. Um, that up through, again, about the top of the staff. I think has just such warm of sensual quality to the sound and I personally love it. Um, the middle notes for me I don't think are quite as hard as they are on flute because um, the embouchure lends itself to um, just making the notes easier to play. So from the top of the staff, you know, you can have some nice quiet, um, just very kind of distant, ethereal writing that works. And with that, you can explore some harmonics for that register. And any good piccolo player is going to know a lot of different fingerings for these notes because we use harmonics a lot because piccolos tend to be so out of tune. So, like, point in case, if I'm performing Bartok Concerto for orchestra, you know, the, the movement is supposed to be the squeaky gay. And it, it's a squeaky gate, right? Um, it's horrid and flat because all the strings always push sharp. So sit there and go. It's just like it sounds crap. So we've got several different fingerings to choose from. The two that work best, which is totally different, but gets a pitch up, or which again slightly different, and, and it really does give you a different sound. Um, so like at the end, I use all harmonic fingerings for that last solo. And you can play nice and soft and the conductor's not doing this, which is really annoying, and um, in tune with a really beautiful sound. So again, piccolo players, if, if they have really studied the instrument, they're going to really be familiar with those alternate fingerings. Um, I did not include this on my list because it's maybe not something that would be so important for composers, but if you are interested, um, Jan Gippo, who is a former uh, piccolo player of the St. Louis Symphony, uh, put together an entire book of all these alternate fingerings, alternate fingerings, to fingerings, and mainly for uh, performance guides. So um, every now and then, like when we do Mahler symphonies, I can never remember the trill fingering for high A to B. It's like something totally crazy, and I have to look it up every time. But all of these things are in that book. So if you um, were working on a pick piece, and you had a, a performer kind of, you know, this works, this doesn't, you can certainly kind of double check in the, in the Gippo. It's called a complete guide to piccolo, or something like that. And um, that has everything that, that you would possibly need in terms of like harmonics for different sonic possibilities. So the lower ranges speak in like a solo or Oh, they definitely do. The caveat is the player has to have a good piccolo. Um, and that is the, the only treacherous area um, in terms of solo piccolo music and, and performing is if you don't have a really good instrument, you're not going to get the sound that you want. So like the best makers, I believe, Keith. Like, this guy is just amazing. Um, Burkhardt also has a good reputation. And the sad thing with piccolos is you have the range of really, really, really expensive professional instruments down to student instruments that only cost a few hundred dollars and play, like, absolute 
pieces of junk, but nothing in the middle. There's not like moderate, you know, bump up piccolos. Yeah, it it's literally goes from crappy student to super expensive professional. So if you um, if you're writing and you have a specific performer in mind, you want to make sure that they're playing on a good instrument because the low notes um, like this. This plays incredibly well in tune, as good as the instrument can. I mean, it's a total disaster. But, you know. Some key clicks in one of the pieces that I'm working on. Key clicks will always sound in the lowest octave of the fingering that you use to produce the click. So, for example, G and the next G are the same fingering. So, if I click my key, I can't make a distinction between a higher G and a lower G. Um, one cool thing you can do for key clicks is you can actually extend past the range of the flute <laughs> by doing a tongue stop. And this looks totally ridiculous, but I have played pieces where you have to use this. So you take your tongue, plug the embouchure hole, and then you get lower notes. So if a, like a low D is this, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> so you can say I am very excited about the pieces that I have that I've been working on. Um, I can't wait to start rehearsing them and finally hear what everything sounds like together. And um, I'm really looking forward to uh, working with uh, all of you and certainly the ones that have uh, written music that I'll be playing.